You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And grace your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you, Lord All the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Let's start with prayer. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, for your mercies that are new every morning. Great are you, Lord. And so we gather together to worship you, uh, if not physically, in spirit. Bless this time together. Through Christ's name, amen. Uh, just a few quick announcements this morning. Um, we're going to be taking a break from Ecclesiastes uh, for a couple months, uh, and we're going to be doing a summer series, uh, Seven Things God Hates. Sounds exciting. Uh, it does to me. Proverbs 6 has a great passage that we're going to break down together. Uh, a bunch of different speakers are going to be joining us uh, to do that. Um, and it's amazing. In this passage, there's seven things that God hates, and in this, uh, it might be not what you expect. 
Uh, a lot of time we have these uh, ideas of what we think God hates, and they're not even listed in this passage. So I really look forward to breaking this down and learning it together. Uh, the Lord really put it on my mind, so I just want to do this and grow together. Uh, at this moment, uh, we have a video from Scott Marcus, one of our elders. Uh, he's just going to do an announcement concerning uh, the reopening of the church, uh, and so just watch that with us. Dear church family, as we navigate these challenging and ever-changing times of the COVID-19 pandemic, we find ourselves faced with the opportunity to consider reopening our church building for use. The Ontario government has allowed places of worship to hold gatherings with a limited attendance of 30% of building capacity. As a leadership board, we have prayed about this and have met together virtually to discuss the matter. While we share the same eagerness to gather together in corporate worship that most of you have, we feel that the church building is not yet ready to be open for meetings and for corporate worship. The leadership has a responsibility to ensure the physical safety and well-being of all those who use the Maple Hill Baptist Church building and attend worship services. This includes not only members and adherents, but also visitors and the general public. At this time, Maple Hill Baptist Church is not prepared to take on the burden of the additional precautionary measures as recommended by the government. These would include, but are not limited to, such things as precautionary signage, dedicated and separate entry and exit points, increased cleaning and disinfecting, reaction plans, and screening measures. We do plan, as a board, to have ongoing discussions throughout the next couple of months to consider the steps necessary when we do feel it is time to reopen the building for use and for corporate worship. We intend to revisit this decision in the early fall of 2020, and an update will be provided at that time. We encourage you to continue worshiping via the online service, and to do this gathered with a small group within the guidelines set forth by our Ontario government for social gatherings. Continue reading God's word, spend time in prayer, attend the weekly virtual prayer meeting. If you know of someone who is unable to access the online worship service, please bring it to the board's attention so we can help them gain access. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please feel free to contact any one of the Maple Hill Baptist Church board members. Thank you. Yeah. 
watching you revealed by nature and miracles you are beautiful you are beautiful the morning star is shining through and every eye is watching you revealed by nature and miracles you are
Without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Sing released. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner. No more. My shame was a ransom. He faithfully of my debt and he called me his friend Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my.
it's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all. Well, happy Canada Day, uh, in a few days anyways. Uh, I want to read quickly from 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, and it says this. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And at this moment, uh, we're actually going to have a quiet time where I'm going to, well, not a quiet time, but I'm going to invite you at home. Uh, in your families or um, as an individual to take specific time to pray for our nation. Uh, so we're going to just take a minute for that. I'm going to leave, uh, leave the floor open for you guys to pray as families. Uh, just a couple minutes and then I will close that off. Um, so let's just do that now. Pray for our nation and for anything that you really feel led to pray for. Father, I, uh, we come before you, Lord, and I just pray that you would forgive us, um, Lord, maybe for the sin of dishonoring those you have put in authority over us and not praying for them. And so, Lord, we just lift up to you our prime minister. We just pray, Lord, that you would be at work in his life, uh, giving him uh, guidance as he makes decisions, Lord. And we pray for all those in government and authority over us, Lord, that, again, you uh, would be at work giving direction, Lord, that we can uh, lead peaceful lives, Lord, that we can worship you without fear. Uh, and even if not, Lord, we just will still worship you. But we do just pray, Lord, for our leaders uh, for the wisdom they need, Lord. Not only them, we pray for the leaders of our church, uh, that you would be watching over them, giving them guidance and instruction, uh, Lord, because you are worthy, Lord. And so we can't do this alone. We need you. We need your spirit to be at work. And so, Lord, I just lift them up again to you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the nation that you have given us uh, to be a part of. I just pray that you would continue to strengthen our nat nation, uh, Lord, that you would 
uh, watch over as there's a, a lot going on with COVID and, and just everything that's going on in the world, Lord. We just need uh, you to be visible, Lord. And just for your church, we pray that we would be looking upward, that we would be an encouragement to the nation around us as we, um, as we just are strengthened by you and as we live joyfully uh, because of you. And so we just thank you, Jesus, for the mercies and grace uh, that you give us and that we can that we can walk in your ways. So strengthen us, spirit, as we do that. And so, Lord, we give the rest of this time to you. Uh, we thank you for your goodness. Through Christ's name, amen.
rescue and die. I want to be where you name above all names. This really needs to be um, true in our lives, that we believe he's the name above all names, that he's worthy of all the praise we can bring, whether that's um, Ruth and I singing here with Mike and Ali, or whether you guys are at home with your family, he's worthy of all that praise, um, and that our hearts would sing truthfully how great is our God, and that we would truly mean that. Let's sing this together. And really pro proclaim it as this is a familiar song. We go through these words time and time again. But let's just sing these out in truth and in spirit.
great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Father, you are great and worthy to be praised. And as now, as we open your word, Lord, we just see how much you have given to us through it. Not always what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. So as we open your word, Lord, speak to us through it. Through Christ's name, amen. If you would like to open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, uh, verses 1 to 10 is what we will be looking at uh, today, and then we will be finishing this off in the fall. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. And they read this. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. The same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead." But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy and every, and have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Verse 7, go eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved you what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. And he has given you, that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge of wisdom and shul to which you are going. I've been, uh, as I've been calling around, talking to people, I've been asking them how they've uh, enjoyed the Ecclesiastes series. And a lot of people were like very uh, apprehensive at the start of what it was going to be like. Uh, Ecclesiastes can be a very uh, misunderstood book. Uh, he, in it, says looking for the meaning of life is like chasing the sun or trying to grasp the wind, trying to grasp smoke. It's hevel. Yet, this book uh, we can have understanding of life so much more. It is not the kind of book that we keep reading until we reach the end and get the answer, like a mystery. Instead, it is a book in which we keep struggling with the problems of life. And as we struggle, we learn to trust God. Uh, these questions uh, it brings challenge us to think about what God is doing, how he works. And not only that, it humbles us as we realize we have to turn to him and trust because we really don't know. And this is how one writer puts, this is how, we, this is how the Christian life works. It's not just about what we get at the end, but it's also about what we become along the way. Discipleship is a journey and not merely a destination. If you're a consumer type person, reading Ecclesiastes is going to be a tough go for you because it doesn't give a lot. Uh, and it asks a lot from us. So I hope that you've been encouraged through this book, that God has been challenging you, trying to get you to go deeper. And so let's just uh, continue our study. Um, verses uh, um, 1 through 2 say this, But all this I laid to heart, 
examining it all. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hands of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifices. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. Um, as I was reading, actually, this passage, I, I was reminded of a movie I remember watching as a kid uh, called The Never Ending, Ending Story. I don't know if you've watched it, but when it came to this part about the hands of God, I just thought of the rock eater and how he just talked about his hands. And this passage really speaks how all things are in the hands of God. And he lays, it says, this all to heart. What is it talking about? What's he laying to heart? Well, you have to go back to chapter 8, verses 14 to 17 that read this. There is also a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity, and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. This, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done under, on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in his seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. There are circumstances in our life, even now, that we just do not understand. There are viruses that we can't comprehend. Uh, as people search, you can go on to the internet and you cannot, like, it's impossible to find a direct answer for many things. There's so much information. I was even reminded where it talked about all the things that Jesus did in John that even if they were all written down, they could not be contained in all the books of the world. And he says he examines this. He turns everything over. No stone has been left unturned. With all his experiences, with all his knowledge, no simple, no complicated philosophy could help him find the answers to life, to life's journey or its purpose. He tried, it just didn't happen. His quest, though, was focused on life under the sun. His eyes are not turned upward, but downward. We must keep that in mind as we read this book, that we must keep our eyes upwards, focused on what God is, is doing, or how God works, or on Jesus, really. Uh, as we struggle for meaning and purpose, we will only find that without our eyes upwards, we will continue downwards. As we keep our eyes upwards, we're humbled and we trust God, realizing that he is above all things. It says, continues in verse 1, it says, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hands of God. And really, this is clutch uh, for understanding this passage. When I go fishing, I love fishing. Uh, I love fishing for bass, and I like using these two j tube jigs. And you cast out, and you kind of just, you know, jiggle a little bit. <laughs> and when they hit, you just smash back on that thing. You got to set the hook, otherwise it gets away. And this passage here, this saying is something you need to grasp to understand. If you don't get this, um, that all the things are in God's hands, if you don't try to get this, if you don't submit to the truth of God's sovereignty, your faith will waver and crumble at the slightest adversity. At the littlest temptation, you will fall. Accepting God's sovereignty gives the gospel sense. It gives God's church purpose. His church, which, which you are, a part of as his body. Yet many struggle to accept that God gives rain both to the just and to the unjust. He didn't spare his own son. He gives good and bad to all. And that is something we must grasp. It talks about his hands here. What about the hands of God? And this again, right back to the uh, never ending story. Uh, if you want, you could Google it. Strong, never ending story, strong hands. And the stone uh, biter, he's just like, they look like such strong hands. And he goes on how he tried to hold his friends in his hand, but the nothing took them. And he was broken for it. 
Uh, a writer named Riken puts it this way. The Bible uses the image of the hand of God to express God's power, love, supervision, and control. Here the metaphor expresses his sovereignty, supervision of his people and their actions. God really does have the whole world in his hands. And I think there's two aspects we need to look at this. The good, uh, for some, those who have faith, have been made righteous through Christ. This is good. The hand of God is an image of comfort and security. If our God is for us, then who can even be against us? In John 10, 27 to 29, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. I mean, I wouldn't be a good father if I didn't talk about my kids here for a second. And uh, Elijah, I'll probably have to owe him an ice cream then for this. But man, you give that kid a candy and you try to get it, he grabs onto that candy and he is not letting go. You can wrestle him, tickle him. He will not let go of that. That's how much passion he has for that. And I really look at that because it just, it's a small illustration of God having us in his hand, gripping us. The security we find in that the peace that it can bring. There's a scary aspect to me, though, for this as well. For others who don't follow the way, it's a reckoning. Hebrews 10, 30 to 31 says this, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is not dead. He is alive. And if you don't know him, it says vengeance is his. Do you really want to fall into the creator's hands, to the one who made you, formed you, created you? I do not want to fall into those hands. Those hands that can be so gentle and loving and creative, and yet the justice and judgment that they will bring. But we have faith that he is a righteous judge. But I, challenge, I just challenge you, think about that. The good and the scary part of God's hands. But this is why the gospel is foundational to everything we do. Because only the gospel brings us under the protection and control of the great I am. Brings us into his hands. Only the gospel can make a real change happen in your heart. And the church is the bringer of this message. How beautiful, as Roman puts it, are the feet of him who brings good news. When was the last time you shared the good news? As, as we talk, as we communicate, as we get to know our neighbors more, have you taken the opportunity? Have you looked for that instance where you can just talk about your faith? Have they opened a door? Have you even prayed that God would open the door for you to bring that good news? COVID isn't a time for believers to regress but to proclaim because we know what his hands are like. In verses three through six, there's this talk about the madness of the heart. You know, it's a crazy world. And what keeps people from being in God's hands in a protective, merciful way is the hearts of men. It is inherently bad. Verse 3 through 6 say this, This is an evil in all that do, is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of men are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For, le for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. 
and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. He points out three things in this passage I'd like to look at. Uh, one, we all die. Two, our hearts are full of evil. And three, we all need hope. Uh, we all die. This is not a new thought. Uh, throughout the book, multiple times he points it out. He brings our mortality to the front. It, se- it makes life seem pretty futile, really. Uh, like most people now uh, with COVID, it's allowed us to do a lot more gardening. Uh, nothing seems more futile um, than gardening. The weeds. doesn't matter how much mulch you put down, they just creep out. You're always, one day you're out, you pull them out, next day you go back, they seem to grow bigger and stronger. Um, but life may seem futile when you think about death, especially because it comes to everyone, the good, the bad, the just, and the unjust. But it is reality the book here wants us to keep in mind, and for a good reason. You can take this in two different extremes. One, you can live life to its fullest only for yourself with no eternal reward, or you can live it in a way that pleases God, knowing the outcome to come, um, knowing that the outcome to come, you can live with purpose and intentional, intentionality that speaks of greater things to come. The, the other thing he points out, the second thing, our hearts are full of evil. I mean, just watch the news. Listen to those around you. I mean, just take a moment to reflect and, and look inside your own heart. And we realize we can be so full of evil. While many have good intents or intentions, it will always be, be contaminated without Jesus Christ and being made righteous through faith. In Jeremiah 79, it says this, the heart is deceitful. The heart deceives us. How is that? So, you know, the heart deceives us by causing us to manipulate the rationale behind our decisions. A lot of times we don't even think about it. We, the victim, all of a sudden become the victim, are suddenly deserving of our heart's desires and deceive ourselves into getting what we want. That's why it's so important to uh, self-reflect, to, to really pray for God's spirit to work in us, to reveal the intentions of our heart. It is deceitful above all things. And yet, even as we can read that, we can be encouraged because yet God makes all things new. He, through Christ, moves into our heart, gives us a new heart in Christ. He indwells us with the Holy Spirit. Piper writes this, Our calling, therefore, is to bear fruit out of the abundance of the heart. Something new is going to come out as an overflow. So while the heart is deceitful and mad, God changes it, renews it, restores it, makes us new. In Ezekiel, he talks about giving people a new heart and new spirit. Ephesians 3:17 says, Christ may that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I mean, if Christ is in your heart, how wicked can it be? Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If your heart is evil at this stage, if you're a believer and your heart is constantly evil, is Christ even in you? Have you pushed him out? Has madness taken over? Repent, change your ways. Which really leads us to this, that we need hope. Uh, we did a whole series on Hebrews 11, the heroes of the faith. And we remember their faith. And we realize that it is hope that fuels faith. They hoped in a coming Messiah, in God's promises to save his people. Jesus is our hope. If you're struggling, Jesus. If you're lost, Jesus. You need purpose, Jesus. He has it all. It all comes back to him. And if your hope isn't in him and the power of the resurrection, well, then the futility of life will overwhelm, overwhelm and cloud your spirit. Great are you, Lord, is a fantastic song. 
As it brings that together. He gives hope. He gives peace. He gives joy. He is hope. And through the steps, we see that there is a way to live. The capre diem, not just that, but with God. Life needs to be lived with God. As we have hope, as we overcome the deceptions of the heart, we can then live in a newness of life, of joy. You know, what does that look like? It's joy and contentment at the simple things, the common things. Life isn't always full of new things. Uh, I mean, faith these days, as consumers, faith can be hard. We can bounce around trying to find what it is that we want instead of giving what God has given us, using our gifts to bless others. As we seek volunteers, as we, as we ask, um, it gets hard to ask people to serve. We as a church shouldn't be having to ask people to come and serve Christ in his body for which God has gifted you to put and pour out what he has given to you. And yet that's the way it seems at time. Faith isn't consumerism. It's about giving. And so he brings this together with God in context. Giving this more value than simply do whatever you like. Verses 7 through 10. When God is central in our lives, we can enjoy the basic things with fullness and not be bored. If you're never satisfied with the basics, you will never be satisfied, period. You will feast, but you will never be full three things I want to look at. Eat and drink with joy. It's contentment. Verse 7, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. Uh, and here he's not talking about vain. There's a sense of urgency. Go. It's like the great commission. Go. Eat your bread. Food is awesome. Love it. During COVID, I've been cooking or baking um, a lot of bread. So we're taking this passage literally here. Uh, we eat it with joy. Actually, too much that Bethany told me I have to stop. No more making pretzel buns. Uh, a lot of people don't like pretzels. I, I just have found this recipe for pretzel buns. Uh, and <laughs> Bethany says, I have to stop. But I can just bring it back to this passage and say, nope. <laughs> we are to eat with joy, our bread with joy. Um, so yeah, anyways, wine. He talks about wine. It's not talking about juice or grape juice. It's talking about literal wine. It makes a merry heart. But remember, it is never intended for drunkenness. He brings it to God for a reason. God wants us to enjoy the basics, not to be gluttons in them, but to enjoy them. Do you praise God for the simple things of life? Do you have joy with those things? The other area he looks at here is number two is live with joy. Sure, things are tough, can be tough, or will be tough, but we can still live with joy. He says in verse 8, through, and nine, let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy the life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. Now, sounds morbid there, vain life. He's really just pointing out how short life is. All the days of your short life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. These idea of garments being white symbolize a happy mood of festivity, uh, but also of purity. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Oil is symbolic of joy and gladness. Not only that, oil was refreshing because of the sun, how it would dry out the skin. And so there we have it. It's, it wants us to find joy 
in every area of life. And he talks about enjoy your marriage. Prepare and rich, people. Uh, that's a thing we got going. Um, well, okay, it's a small inside joke since we have a small bubble, but prepare and rich. God wants us to enjoy our marriage. Not only that, he wants you to enjoy any relationship you have with your friends, family. If you are struggling in your marriage, uh, we do uh, offer... Um, a session, some sessions through Prepare and Rich uh, that are fantastic uh, for really getting um, couples to really think about their faith. Uh, I didn't want to do a blurb on that, but there it is. Um, these things, though, it points out, are all toil and work. It's funny, it talks about let your garments be white, don't be lacking oil, find joy in all these things. Uh, they're your portion in life. And in your toil at which you toil under the sun. It takes work. All these things take hard work. Joy, it can, it can come and go, but it's supposed to be there. We fight for it. You fight down the lie. You look how God has us in our hands and we find joy in that. I know it sounds easier said than done, but it is in the mind. To be defeated before you even praise. And the last thing he points out is work with joy. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Not going to lie, it's a lazy world out there. Maybe you're a lazy person listening. And God hates laziness. It's actually one of the things that we're going to be looking at uh, in Proverbs but he tells us to do it with our might. Why? Because we do it for him. Because he is worthy for his glory. Why do a half job when you can do a full job and praise and honor God? God hates laziness. Whatever your hand finds to do, wherever you're at, whatever job you have, Whatever task you have, you throw everything you have behind it. You find joy in it. Some people go, oh, well, Mike, you probably don't understand. You know, you just sit at a desk. Uh, one summer, uh, I had to work on the farm, and the gutter broke. And I tell you, you try slopping out 50 cows uh, manure day in, for twice a day that's liquid in 35 degree humid weather. Uh, yeah, I, I, we found joy in that. Me and Bethany had to do that together, uh, but we do it for him. Yeah, it's a toil, it's work. Uh, and and for, unfortunately, our culture, everybody thinks they deserve way more for, for way less than what they give into it. But if you believe in Jesus, you love him, put it forward all your might in what you do. So we've looked at a few things. We've talked about the hands of God, the good and the bad. We've talked about the madness of the heart. And all these things lead us to a way to live. How we can eat and drink with joy. How we can live with joy. How we can work with joy. I pray that as you hopefully look at this some more yourself, that God would work in you, that his spirit would guide you and give you more uh, from this. Uh, I hate to take a break from Ecclesiastes, but um, looking forward to where he leads us from here. Um, again, let's just pray, close our time in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. I thank you for your strong hands that are a source of comfort, encouragement, and protection. And Lord, I pray for those who don't understand your hands that can bring judgment. And Lord, I just lift up to you those who have lost hope and need you, Jesus. That while we read this book, as we study it, Lord, we know that there's more to the story. And it's you, Jesus. 
So I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would be at work in the lives of those who are wavering, who are struggling, that they can be encouraged in you, Lord. And that through this, we can live with joy, that we can eat and drink for you, for your glory, for the simple things you give us because you have provided them. Lord, that we can live with joy, that we can be content always, that we can be happy. As believers, we are different. And so I just pray, Lord, that we would think about that, that our faces wouldn't be cast down, that we would be lifted up as we think about and as we live for you. And Lord, in all that we do, as we work, as we play, may we do it with all our might because you are worthy. And Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to die and for giving us the spirit. Spirit, we just thank you for being at work in our lives. And I pray that you would push hard into them for those who are resisting you, that you would soften and break down the barriers. So we give you praise at this moment because you are worthy. Through Christ Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. As we close in this song, um, we're going to sing this joyfully. Um, I remember somebody said to me once um, that this is a song that we shouldn't really do anymore because the, the old church used to sing it with joy, and we can't do that. Um, and I think um, that's a bad reason not to do a song, or to do it, actually, but um, this is a song that, that allows us to express joy and sing with, with passion. Um, and so let's sing it together, and let's sing it joyfully, I'm reflecting on what the Spirit has led Mike to tell us and teach us. And um, yeah, let's join our voices together and sing this. We sing in jubilation, adoration to a joyful King. You are spinning and you are singing zealous love over all your children. We sing it. We sing in jubilation, adoration to a joyful king. You are spinning, you are singing, zealous love over all your children. Joyful music lifts us up.
Well, everyone, may the, may the joy of the Lord be your strength this week. Uh, even now as you go to eat, uh, eat with joy, with gladness in your hearts as you fellowship together, uh, as you eat. Uh, be merry. Uh, the Lord watch over you this week. Uh, may he be a source of strength, comfort, and joy to you all. Uh, his blessing upon you.